OK, we saw that we can actually use the asymptotic uh, transfer function equation to determine the transfer function of the feedback loops in a way that's in, in a form that's conducive to design. So now let's look at an, a couple of other examples where this is applied in more interesting ways, and there's some interesting results that come out of it. Uh, the first thing we would do, like to do, actually, is to look at the, um, the so -called, there's a stage called Cherry Hooper which is very interesting because of the following thing. So, so far, all the feedback we've seen in the feedback path, the feedback network, was a purely passive network. And it was by design, essentially, right? Because we designed it because we said the argument was that if you want the gain of the system to be determined primarily by what's in the feedback path, you want this to be as simple and as invariant to parameters as you can make it, right? So now we are going to actually talk about a stage that has active feedback, active devices in the feedback path. And you may say, why are we doing this? Well, we'll see because it allows us to actually modulate, to control certain properties of this path and, and make it emulate a controllable, underdamped response. So let's, let's, let's look at the stage first. So the stage kind of looks like this. It may be actually implemented in a differential implementation too, but it is something like this. So you have a forward path that's like a common source or a common emitter. And then you have in your feedback path, you have a follower stage. And let's say you're driving it with an I in to make it simple in terms of analysis. So this is, let's call this M1, M2, R3. I think this is R2 and R1, but let's try to keep it consistent with your Handouts, let me just make sure that we use the right, uh, yes, it's okay, so that's what we use. Okay, R2 and R1. So this is called, this state by the way is called Cherry Hooper, named after these two people, these two guys who did that. So let's look at it from an analysis perspective. Let's, let's analyze this. And, and, and you know, we are trying to use the return ratio basis analysis, basically asymptotic transfer function. Um, calculation. So the most important parameter, as always, is H infinity, right? And to do that, you can also kind of, if, if it makes you feel better or a little bit more comfortable, we'll draw the small signal model here. So you have a, for this guy, this is a grounded source. So I'll use the pi, we use the pi model, GM, I mean, for convenience, it don't have to, there's no, it's a suggestion, not a rule, I guess. And then you have R1 and R2. And then here you have a follower, so source is not grounded. So again, the suggestion, not the rule, is to use the T model. So you have an RM2. This is IS2, IS2. And then there's R3. That would come to here. This is basically V1. And then this is I in. Okay? So if you want to determine the asymptotic transfer function, basically you're saying that there is a k here. We can pick this source, k, and set k to infinity. If I set k to infinity, what would happen is that to have, and we've checked, we, well, we haven't checked really the sign of the feedback, so we have to do that first, make sure that it's negative feedback. So if this node goes up, this is an inverting stage, this goes down. This goes down. This is a follower to follow, and it brings it back down, which basically means that's negative feedback. And in negative feedback, in this case, basically to have a finite output, when you have an infinite input, and this is output, uh, what you need to do, what needs to happen is what? The asymptotic equality principle tells you what? The asymptotic equality principle tells you that essentially your input, this V1 has to be zero. Because if you want to get a finite current out here, and this is your V out too, right? If you want to get finite current, have a finite output voltage, with it K being infinity, then V1 has to be zero, asymptotically at least. So it means that under that condition, these two have to be equal. Which basically means that there's no current flowing through this anyway, even if there were a capacitor. If, even if there was a capacitor here, it wouldn't really be a current flowing. So what, which basically means that this current is all going through here. 
right? It has to. Now, and what that means is that IS2 is negative I in, I in. Okay, so that has to be that. In, or more accurately, what is this voltage? What does this voltage, or more useful, not more accurately, more useful, what does this voltage have to be? What does this voltage have to be? This voltage is zero, right? This current is I in. So this voltage, do you agree that this voltage has to be negative R M2 plus R3, these two resistors, times I in, which is going through it? Because this is zero. That's the voltage drop across this guy, so that's going to be the voltage here. That has to be, right? But in, under feedback, also, there's no, current, I mean, there's no current flowing through here, right? Um, so this current is zero, because this is the gate current, which basically means that this resistive divider needs to produce this voltage here, which means that V out times R2 over R1 plus R2, which is that resistive divider here, right? has to be equal to this quantity, negative I in uh, times Rm2 plus R3. And from this, you basically find your H infinity, which is V out over I in, okay, going to infinity, which is, again, negative R3 plus Rm2 times 1 plus R2 Oh, sorry. Uh, R1 over R2. OK? And so that's for that. So that's for the H infinity. So if you want to design it to have a certain transfer, so this is basically, by the way, this is a ratio of output voltage to input current, which basically means that it's some sort of a transfer resistance determined by this and scaled by that. Now, the other thing that you need to find out when we are doing this is also the return ratio, right? And the, the forward transfer function. We need really three function, uh, direct forward transfer, right? So if you want to calculate the return ratio, what you can do, we can take this and introduce some iz, which really doesn't matter. What matters is ix and iy. And also, also your source, your independent source is nulled, which would produce an ix through here, OK? And then this ix produces a voltage here, which is negative ix r2, if that's ix, right? This voltage now will appear across here, right? What is the gain of this follower from here to there at low frequencies? Assuming that somehow the bias is maintained, of course, some sort of current. What is the gain? Well, isn't it the voltage divider between this resistance and these resistances? Which is what? This resistance is now infinity. So it is simply one. So, the return, so the, this voltage reflects directly here. So this is going to be negative IXR2. And then you go through another GM for return ratio K is 1. Um, so you get a GM1 R2. So that's your return ratio. T defined as negative IY over IX is GM1 R2. Okay. Now, that's the return ratio. And then there's a third parameter we need to calculate, right? What is the third parameter? We need to calculate the direct forward transfer. Direct forward transfer H0. So H0, what is H0? Well, we still need to set K to 0. If we set K to 0, Right? And find what is the transfer function from the input to the output. Well, this is not going to be here. This is going to be here. So if k is 0, if I put a current through here, what would I get at the output? Well, the way the circuit is drawn, if I put a current here, right now at low frequencies, nothing's going to go through because this current is going to be 0 no matter what. So there's no, it can't induce any change at the output. And this pathway is killed because k is 0, so that's going to be 0. So 
what, is, what you see here is that it's basically a, 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 a very standard classical calculation. And now, what, if, what happens if there are some, some dynamics in the circuit? So let's say there are some capacitors in the circuit. So let's say for the sake of argument that you have a capacitor at the input, let's call it C1, and a capacitor at the output, let's call it C2. You want to see what the dynamics look like, right? Because that, that's what matters really for this stage, this particular stage. Um, OK, and we are simplifying. Of course, we are, not we are not taking everything into account. So if you look at that, let's see what changes in these calculations. In the H-infinity calculation, what would change? When, under H-infinity, when K goes to infinity, right, we say that this voltage needs to go to 0. If this voltage goes to 0, then this capacitor is not going to carry any current, the input capacitor. So that wouldn't matter. It wouldn't enter the equation because there's no current flowing through it. So C1 is not going to enter the equations. How about C2? Well, C2 is going to sit there, but whatever the feedback does, it has to force the output voltage to have this relationship with the input current. So that wouldn't enter this equation either. So this part does not change. So the H infinity part of it actually does not change. The only part that does actually change is this part and possibly this part, right? Because in this configuration, it's not generally, generally true, but I'm saying that because of these two capacitors where they sit, this happens. So now let's go back to T. And so, so let's call this T of zero, right? Because this is the low frequency uh, return ratio. So if you have the low frequency return ratio, now if you want to go what happens to the high frequency return ratio, you really what you're looking at is that, okay, you have an IX driving here, you have a capacitor here, C2, and you have a capacitor, C1, here. And you want to know what that transfer function looks like. Right? You already have determined the DC part of this thing. So you want to see if this trans new transfer function, with, because of those two capacitors, how many poles and how many zeros it has, if it can say anything about it, and if it can determine where those things are. So first of all, the transfer function from this IX to back to this IY, how many poles and how many zeros are we talking about? How many independent degrees of freedom, first of all, do we have? You have two, right? If this were a voltage source here, then you would have had one, because you have this capacitor that's in parallel with a voltage source that would be nulled and would be shorted. But if it's a current source, yes. So you have two degrees of freedom. If you short circuit either one of them, or a combination, do you get a non-zero transfer return ratio? No, right? If you short circuit either one of them, nothing gets to the output, right? Nothing comes back, well, more accurately. If you apply, launch something here, nothing will come back if you short circuit this or that or a combination. So there are no zeros in the, transfer, in the return ratio. So they have two poles, no zeros. We know that by just inspection. We know one more thing actually by inspection. These two time constants are actually uncoupled if you look at them. Why? Because the resistance seen by this guy is not changed whether or not you short circuit this one. Right? Or vice versa. Which means that you have two poles, two real poles, that are the one, negative one over the inverses of the time constants associated with it. So all we need to know is to determine time constant, the two time constants, tau 1 and tau 2. So we need to know what tau 1 is, and we don't even need to say tau 1, 0, because this is really tau 1. So tau 1, which is equal to tau 1, 0, is what? The time constant seen by this, the what is the resistance seen by this capacitor? What do you see? Well, you see R3 plus R1, R, uh, RM, RM2, right? That's the, res the resistance looking into the source of this guy. So it is going to be C1 times Rm2 plus R3. And then tau 2 is going to be tau 2, 0, because they are uncoupled. Um, and then what happens is that, what is that time constant? What is the resistance seen by this guy when the sources are nulled? Well, you see R1 plus R2, right? So there are two time constants there. And what happens is that you have these two time constants. So your new, trans, your new your total return ratio, so T of S, 
is going to be t of 0, 1 plus tau 1s, 1 plus tau 2s. But your overall transfer function, though, what is your overall transfer function? What is your total transfer function from the asymptotic transfer function equation, right? For, from that, we know that h of s is going to be h infinity in general of s times t of s, the return ratio plus 1 over t of s. And then there's a second term, h0, 1 over 1 plus, that's also a function of s, 1 plus t of s. In this case, this is 0, right? This is still 0 at high frequencies, because there's no pathway through here to, with the capacitors we have included. Um, so this term doesn't matter. So this is the, that. And this is not a function of frequency. So this is just h infinity. And then what you need to look at is really this ts over 1 plus ts. And what you will get, you can easily see, is basically something so you can actually do it. So you get t of 0 over 1 plus tau 1s, 1 plus tau 2s, divided by 1 plus t of 0, 1 plus tau 1s, 1 plus tau 2s. And when you wrap it up, you will end up in a situation that we've seen before. In other words, you get h infinity t0 over 1 plus t0. Then what you end up with, you have these other terms, which are 1 over, oh, this marker is dying, so I need to switch. You get 1 over 1 plus uh, tau 1 plus tau 2 over 1 plus t of 0 of s plus tau 1 tau 2 over 1 plus t of 0 s squared. Right. And of course, these are low frequency. And this is, we've, we've looked at this before. We know what happens with this case, right? So if you look at this, is that you start with the two poles at a negative 1 over tau 1 and negative 1 over tau 2. And as you increase t naught, t0 going up, the return ratio going up, these starts moving together. They hit each other in the middle. And they basically then they expand and become complex. When the q becomes, so this is the point where q is 1 half. Zeta is 1. So and for that value exactly, this happens when t of 0 is greater than um, tau 1 plus tau 2 over 4 tau 1 tau 2, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, squared, yeah. This one, the, the, tau 1 minus tau 2 squared over there. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so that's basically this point, well, or we can say this particular point happens when these are equal. So as you increase the loop, you can see you start with real poles. And as you increase it, the poles become complex. And we'll see that when we talk about stability even more, kind of like this kind of behavior, which is important. So that's one example. But now what you, the key point about this stage, this Cherry Hooper stage, is that it allows you to actually control the damping ratio of this stage by controlling the amount of feedback, which is really primarily controlled by the ratio of these resistors. Right? So you can use them from a design perspective, you can use the ratio of R1 and R2 to determine how, how much damping you have. Because that determines your T naught, right? And then also H infinity. I'm sorry. So that determines your H infinity transfer function. And then you can control, sorry, I misspoke. I can, you can control the damping ratio by controlling GM1 R2. So you can actually control the damping ratio by GM1 R2, the, the strength of this transistor and the size of this resistor. So, so yeah, you still use the size of R2 to determine this. So the ratio of this matters because size of R2 will determine. But GM1 R2 determines how much damping you have. So you can turn it, you can tune the damping. You can make it underdamped, overdamped, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually emulate an inductor load, like a shunt peaking, by using this if you need something like that. But it's much more compact than an on-chip inductor, for example. Um, what's the disadvantage then? What is the drawback? What is the drawback of the stage? We talked about it very briefly in the beginning, kind of alluded to it. The drawback is that now you have active circuits in the feedback. And if you have active net, an active circuit that can generally be nonlinear, right? 
So if you have nonlinearity in the feedback path, what happens to that nonlinearity? It will exhibit itself in inverse form in the, forward in the, in the closed loop transfer function. So your transfer function is not necessarily very linear, but it allows you to create these peakings. So if there are, you're in a situation where the linearity is not the primary concern, but being able to control the damping ratio actively in a small compact area is an important thing, you can use it. And then you can use it, of course, this is, this is a single-ended one. You can always make it differential, right? So you can, you can make a copy of this on the other side. You can put a current source, share the sources, and then put a current source down there, and that will become a differential stage if you need it. So that's one example of kind of like fancy stuff that can happen in the feedback. The other thing that actually happens, so this is another, I'm going to show you another example kind of briefly. I'm not, we are not going to go too deeply into it, but uh, just give you a sense of thing. So all the feedback network that we've seen so far have been really kind of you could identify a single feedback loop path, right? But that's not necessarily the case. There can be multiple feedback paths. So let's see a simple example and see how this methodology is applied to one with multiple feedback paths, with two paths in this case. And then it, it's, it's a whole big subject to discuss. I mean, it's like really a long, large discussion um, if you want to go down that route. But let's just start with something to just show you, give you a taste at least of how it looks like. So, so we are looking at something with a double feedback. So let's start with one of our stages that we've already discussed a lot. So this stage, this is a series shunt stage, if you will. That's what we called it uh, for. Um, so you had, we have this. Yeah. OK. So you have R1, R2, R3. And then this was the V out. And this is the VN, right? So you have something like this. So this one was a, this is clearly a kind of, it appears like a simple feedback loop, right? I mean, and it's a negative feedback in the sense that if you look at that, I mean, we've analyzed this circuit several times before, right? Uh, if this node goes up, for example, this goes down, it's an inverting stage, this goes down, this goes down, this is like a common gate from this perspective, this goes down, so it's negative feedback. Right? So, so far, this is something, not, nothing fancy. And we've looked at this before. And this was M1 and M2. But now, I'm gonna, we are going to add a, an, an extra fat path for feedback. We're going to take, um, take a resistor here and bring it to the input. And then we can either do it as a current or a voltage. So if you want to make a voltage, you can have a resistor. So this is R5 and R4. And then you can have a VN. So now you can have a, you have a second feedback path. By the way, what is the sign of this feedback path? Is it positive feedback or negative feedback? Well, we can look at it, right? You can say, let's say, I don't know. This node goes, well, it went down before, so let's keep it down. So if it went down, what comes back here, this is moving down. Now, the path you have through here, this is going to invert it, so it's going to go up. Sorry. It's going to go up, which is going to go up, and then it's going to basically go down here. So this new feedback path is actually positive feedback. So we put a little bit of a positive feedback on top of a negative feedback. Is it detrimental? Are we dead in the water? No, not necessarily. All of these things are a matter of how much, right? If you're, for example, if your positive feed, negative feedback still dominates, you can easily think about it. If R4 was infinity, then this should be OK, right? If it's a little bit less than infinity, it still should be OK. Right? Depends on how much lower than infinity it is. I'm, I'm joking. So, so, uh, so, he, so he, here's the thing. Um, well, I guess I was saying mathematically cringe-worthy things. Ma um, okay. Now, how do we analyze this? What do we do with something like this? So, what are your thoughts? How should we analyze this?
What can we do? Well, can we still use the asymptotic transfer function equation? Yes. There was no assumptions in that derivation about how many feedback paths you have, how they're connected. There's another way to just write the transfer function. So we can do that. So to do that, what do we do? Well, one way to do it is basically just looking at, we can, we can draw the small signal model for this and say, look, this is the way it looks. Um, R5, RM1, um, IS1, R3, GM2, V2, let's call this V2, and then you have the R1 and R2, R1, R2, coming back here, and let me just keep the color code a little bit consistent. Uh, so you have the R5, and then you have the R4. Here, this is V out. These are ground, AC ground, AC ground, and AC ground. Okay, and this is your whatever, V in. Okay, so now we can pick a source. Let's pick this one, for example. If we pick this one and say, okay, K going to infinity for inf uh, you know, the transfer, um, asymptotic transfer function, what do we get? Well, again, we are not going to do the full analysis, but I'm going to show you how it's done. So if K goes to infinity, what does that tell you? It tells you that this voltage for, to get finite output means that this volt, this current, which relates to this voltage, this IS1, and hence this voltage, have to be zero, right? So it means that asymptotically, when this happens, these two have to be zero. This voltage has to be zero. And if that voltage is zero, right, you end up with a simple network, right? I mean, you can, then you have a relationship. You know something. You know that if this is zero, then there will be, and there's no current flowing through here, so this current is zero too. You know that this current has to be the same as that current, right? So what does that tell you? It says, let's call this, I don't know, we call this V, uh, did we call something V1? Okay, V1. So what we know is that V in minus V1, which is the voltage across this resistor divided by R5, which is now this current, equals V1 minus V out over R4, right? Is this enough to solve this equation, to, to, to know what the transfer function is? No, right? Because you still are, you need to know what V1 is. There's one, you, you have, you need an equation that relates V in and V out, but you also have a V1 in there. But you know also something else, that because of this being the feedback when k is infinity, these two voltages have to be equal. So this voltage have to be, this voltage is also V1, right? Has to be forced to be V1 for these two to be equal. If this is V1, this is V1, right? And if this is V1, basically, but now you have a resistive divider here. Because this current is also zero now. So that's simple. So we know that V1 over V out is R1 over R1 plus R2, right? And then, so now you can actually plug this into this guy and get some sort of a transfer function. So if you plug it in and solve for V out over V in, you will get when k going to inf is going to infinity, you get R4 times R1 plus R2 divided by R1, R4 minus R2, R5, which you can write as 1 plus R2 plus over R1 times 1 minus, 1 over 1 minus R2, R5, divided by R1, R4. So, what's the takeaway from this? 
What did this new feedback, this new second feedback path do? That's kind of, I think. So you remember what the transfer function was, the, the, the asymptotic transfer function before, when you had the, um, so before, when you didn't have this path, it was simply h infinity was 1 plus r2 over r1, right? That was how we determined, fixed this transfer. If that's what we had, that was the transfer. That's how we designed, right? He said if you wanted this two voltage gain of this thing to be 10, you set r2 to over r1 to 9. And then we make this like 10. Now, you have the same thing multiplied by this factor. But this factor is interesting. You see, this factor is actually becoming, the, the overall multiplicative factor is actually greater than 1. Right? Because the denominator is smaller than 1, because that's min there's a minus sign, and those are positive resistors. So what is it doing? It's actually increasing the gain. Right? This is greater than 1 in general, unless your resistors are negative. But you're, if for positive resistors, that's, that's greater than 1. And what that means is that you have a way of boosting the gain. You have boosted the gain. How have you boosted the gain? Why, have, why is it there gain boosting? It's because you have introduced positive feedback into your system, right? So the second feedback path is positive feedback. That's actually boosting your gain in a predictable fashion, right? And you can see, if the test is, if you set R4 to infinity, right, which is basically meaning that removing the second feedback path, make it open, if R4 goes to infinity, this goes to zero, so this becomes one, this whole. So it makes sense. But by controlling R4 and R5 with respect to R1 and R2, you can actually tune the gate of this thing. You can crank it up a little bit. And that was the f first time, I mean, f positive feedback was used before negative feedback. Why? Because 100 years ago, the problem was not stabilizing the gain or making it stable or something like that. The problem was to get gain. So if you had something that had a gain of 1.5, whatever you did to make that gain 3 was a useful thing. So you're not too worried about, OK, OK, how stable they I just wanted to gain, gain, period. And that's why positive feedback works. And then when, you, when they, people learn how to make better vacuum tubes and eventually transistors and things of that sort, then they said, OK, we have plenty of gain, so now I can trade that extra gain with other things, with how well it's designed. Also. But you can also play these things. So you can actually see it in this network. So that the approach that we have also applies for like bubble feedback and multiple feedback loops and all those things. So we can uh, deal with that. So, so that's another example of return ratio. So a third set of examples, quickly, is if we take the same stage without, with the single feedback, not the double, the original arrangement. And we've looked at this several times. So this should not, hopefully, it shouldn't take too long. But we'll look at it in. Um, okay. uh, we'll look at it two different ways. We look at it once with using the T model for the input. And this should be rather quick, hopefully. So this is GM1, GM2, V2. Uh, this is V out. And V in, RM1, IS1, IS1, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a simple analysis that we've completely done before. So I'm just going to write the results very quickly for you here. So if we do it this way, there are, and take this source as a reference source for the return ratio calculation. You have the K. If K goes to infinity, this becomes 0. We know that H infinity in this case, um, so we have the asymptotic transfer function or asymptotic gain was 1 plus r2 over r1. This is similar to the previous example with single feedback loop from that, right? Now, the return ratio for the source is, again, 
the way to do it, K is one, you apply third second source, so you basically have an IX and IY. IX goes through here, so what you get is R negative R3. You get a GM2, so you get negative GM2 R3. That's the current that goes through here. Then this current gets current divided between this path and that path. Right? And the current divided ratio is between R1, uh, is happening between R1 and Rm. So you get a GM2 R3. Current divided ratio, divider ratio is R1 over R1 plus Rm. So that's the return ratio. I mean, we've done this before. I'm doing it very quickly because of that. And H0, when K goes to 0, is the voltage that ends up at the output. You can again see that if there's a voltage here, this is not here. Now, and, and if this is not here, this voltage would be zero. This will not be here. So what you have is that you have a network that looks like this. V in, Rm1, this guy, R1, this guy, and R2, and this is V out. And for that, the resistive divider basically is this one, because there's no current flowing through that. So it would be R1 over R1 plus Rm1. We've done this before. Okay. So these are the three parameters that we calculated before. Now, let's redo this circuit. But now instead of the T model here, let's use the pi model and see what happens. If I use the pi model for that M1 transistor, it's a different source, right, I mean, essentially. What we are defining is a different source. So we have R3. We'll keep this one the same, GM2, V2. And then R2 and R2. And so this is connected here. R, so this is R2 and R1, sorry. Um, R3. So this is V pi 1. This is GM1, V pi 1. And this is V in. Okay. Um, all right. So let's calculate the, th the th three parameters again for this circuit. So I'm just going to draw a line here to separate these. So this is the same circuit, but using a different model for the transistor. And we are going to calculate the return ratio with respect to this source now. So we are calculating, we are applying the K here. So, and, 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 asymptotic transfer function with respect. So first k going to infinity, if k goes to infinity, what happens? k going to infinity means that because it's a negative feedback, so a finite output here, v out, you need to have finite cur current, uh, current here, and to have finite current with k infinity means that v pi has to be zero. So this means that this is zero, asymptotically. Which basically means that this voltage is v in. Right? However, what now we have is that we have this current flowing still through here. We said this current is finite. We didn't say it's zero. So there's some current. Let's call it I1. Right? Um, OK, let's pick a color. Yeah, so let's call this current I1, which is the same thing here, I1. There would be a current flowing. If that current is I1, right, what we are trying to find out is what's the relationship between V out and VO. We cannot write simply V in is the voltage divider ratio because there's current flowing through here. Right? So we need to find out what that current is. So if this is I1, this voltage here is going to be negative I1 R3. This current would be negative, well, negative GM. R GM2 R3 I1, which would be the current that's coming out of here. It's the same current. Um, so now what we know is that if we want to find out what is the current through this guy. Right? What is the current through that guy? It's I1 minus this current. So it's minus, minus GM2 R3 or negative GM2 R3 I1. So you get I1 times I1 times 1 plus GM2R3 gives you this current. So that's this current. Now, and that current is going through R3. So if you multiply by R3, it produces the voltage. So that's V in. Right? It has to be V in. 
the voltage across the sky is Vn. You mean R1 and R1? Oh, I, I meant R1, yes, thank you. OK, so the current through that is R, um, v, uh, determines the Vn, so that's Vn. Now, but I also know that, what else do I know? So, so, so this is the relationship in Vn and I1, right? But we know something else. What else do we know that we can use? We know the relationship in V out and Vn, right? We know V out minus V in is what? Is the voltage across this resistor, which is R2 times this current, which we said was um, negative GM2R3I1. So if I plug I1 from this into this guy, you can easily see, I mean, just, just plug it in and calculate it. And what you will see is the following. You will get an H infinity that is 1 plus R2 over R1 times GM2. You know what? Let me write it. This is too low. So you get an H infinity prime. Let's call it H infinity prime. 1 plus R2 over R1. GM2 R3 over 1 plus GM2 R3. OK? Which is clearly different from this H infinity that we calculated before. The asymptotic transfer function. Is there a problem? Did we mess something up? No. That is correct, actually. What does it tell you? Is that, well, the asymptotic transfer function really is not a fundamental invariant of the circuit. It's basically defined with respect to a source. And even if you change that, that source, it's not even the different transistor, the kind of source that you use, it will produce something else. But is this a fundamental problem? Well, maybe not. So let's calculate the T prime. You can calculate the T prime with the same kind of argument, and we can go through it, and H0 prime. H0 prime is easy to see it's 0, right? Because if you set this to 0, right, there's no pathway from here to there for V in to affect this guy. Because they're not connected. So nothing gets to the output, so that's 0. And if you actually go ahead and calculate the T prime, what you will get is GM1 R1 1 plus R3 over RM2. So that's T prime, which is, again, different from the T prime we calculated before, from the T we calculated, the return ratio that we calculated before. So we have a different H infinity, we have a different H, and we have a different H0. But if you actually plug them into that equation, the asymptotic transfer function, H being H infinity um, T over 1 plus T plus H0, 1 over t1 plus t, and you will find out that actually it is equal to h infinity prime t prime 1 over t prime plus h0, which in this case is 0, over t prime. So although the individual ingredients are not the same individually, but in combination, they are all equal. And if you want to know actually what that is, I'm just going to write it here. GM1, GM2, it's in your handouts, R3, R1 plus R2 plus GM1, R1 divided by 1 plus GM1, R1, 1 plus GM2, R3, which is a useless form, really, in my opinion. This is a useless form. I mean, it may look more compact, and it is more compact, but it's more useless because you don't know what's what and what affects what, what, how. But if just you want to verify things, you can verify that. So what's the t key takeaway from this? The key takeaway from this is that, look, it's the return ratio, you saw, it's not the same here and there, 
neither is the asymptotic transfer function. So there is no invariance for return ratio. So this is an example to show you how that invariance doesn't exist. And we'll see that we need to use the loop gain and define a parameter that is an invariant of the loop for a well-defined loop that would be an invariant of the loop, and we'll see how they relate to each other. Any questions on this? No? All right. 